Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 today and verse 1. This uh, picture, incidentally, that is uh, on the screen is a picture of ruins that are in uh, the city of Ephesus. It has a different name now. It's in modern-day Turkey, like we saw in our in our introduction. But these ruins that you see there on the screen still exist. It's actually uh, ruins of the Library of Celsus. He was Celsus was a a Roman senator, and uh, this library was built in the city of Ephesus in his honor. Uh, and it was actually the third largest library in the ancient world, kind of showing the pro- prominence of the city of Ephesus back in the, back in the times of Christ. And, and Paul, when he's writing this letter, it actually uh, was ruined, obviously. And then this uh, facade was actually put back up in the 70s and uh, 1970s, that is. And that's sort of what it looks like uh, today. Well, the book of Ephesians is all about the church's character, the, the makeup of the church. What is the church? Paul describes that in Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, the blessings that go along with being a member of the church. And this letter also is about the church's conduct. We read some of that in our scripture reading this morning in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Well, that the church's conduct, how we should then live our lives as believers in Christ is all spelled out in Ephesians chapters 4 through 6. So a really easy outline for this book, just two parts. First half, second half. That's the way a lot of, of Paul's letters are. We looked at some of this introductory material. Who were the Ephesians? We saw that they were essentially, they were pagan people, uh, worshipped many false gods, primarily Diana or Artemis, as, is, as she is known by her Greek name. And However, they heard the gospel presented to them from the Apostle Paul, the gospel being the good news. You can have the forgiveness of your sins, by only trusting in him, like we just sang about. Only believe in him, and you will have the forgiveness of sin, salvation, eternal life given to you. Well, the, the Ephesians believed that. And then several years later, Paul wrote this letter to them. We investigated that, saw that Paul is the author of this letter. He wrote it during his first Roman imprisonment, probably 60 to 62 AD, AD 60 to 62 good time frame from when he, for when he wrote this letter. He wrote it to the Ephesians. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, this morning again. But they were, and it was probably delivered to other churches in the surrounding area. No, what is known as an encyclical le- letter. It's made, cycled through the various churches in the area of Ephesus. Paul Paul wrote this letter so that the Ephesians would know more about who Jesus Christ is and what he is doing in this world today. What is his plan and purpose? He wrote this letter to them because the only way we are going to know more about Christ and who he is and what he's doing is if God tells us that. And he's done that in the Bible. He did that by inspiring Paul to write this letter. Ephesians is all about the church. What's inside this letter? Well, that was our outline of this material, the church's character and conduct, the makeup of the church, what makes the church, and then how we as believers should be living. We should study this letter because it's written to a specific church, but it has very relevant material for all of us today as believers in Christ because we're still living in this church age, the time when the church is God's method or means of giving out the good news. And this age is coming to a, clo- coming to a close. Uh, we looked at a lot of the evidence for that, that is pointing to the fact that we are nearing the end of this time where 
God is going to deal with the world in this way. So that makes this letter very critical for us to understand. So last time we began actually getting into the text of the letter, we saw that uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. We studied those first two, two points last time. Paul was an apostle. He was a messenger of Christ. He was given his role as a messenger directly from the risen Lord. That is a qualification to be an apostle, have that title of apostle that Paul takes. You had to see the risen Lord. You had to be commissioned by the Lord to give out this message. Well, that's Paul. Personally, I believe he is the 12th apostle, the one who replaced Judas, but uh, you don't, you know, that's not a certain thing from the Bible by any means. But Paul was given this commission to go to Gentile people. The, the message of the good news first went to Jewish people. Uh, they had the first, first right of refusal, if you will, it was given to the Jewish people. They're given the offer. Do you want to believe in Jesus Christ as your Messiah, the way that you can be forgiven? Many of them did. Not all of them by any stretch. Most of them rejected the, the message, vociferously, violently rejected the message. And that's why Paul turned to the Gentiles. God, being omniscient, knowing all things, from all eternity past, knowing every single thing that would happen, knowing every single decision that you and I would make, that the Jewish people would make, every possible decision that we could make. God knows all of these things. That's what it means to be omniscient. God doesn't learn things as he goes along. This is something that is impossible for us to understand. He is doing things in the world, not planning them as he goes along. He didn't make a plan sometime in eternity past. First, I'm going to do this. Then, oh, the people will do this, so I'll do that. And then this and that. God doesn't work that way. He knows everything from all time. We say that he makes a plan because that's how we uh, operate as finite people. God isn't that way. He doesn't have to chronicle plan things out. He knows everything all the time, always. And so he knew the Jewish people would reject the message in large measure. So he had a man ready and waiting to take the message to the Gentile world. Because after all, God wants the world to be in his kingdom. The, the, the offer of salvation is not just for the Jewish people. The offer of living in the kingdom upon this earth isn't just for Jewish people, this future kingdom that's going to come. It's for the world. Matthew 22. God is going to fill his kingdom with both Jewish people and Gentiles. And Paul is that one who was given this message to take to the world. And he was doing this by the will of God. That's the, the authority behind the message that Paul has. This is God's will for him to do this. We saw how uh, God's will can sometimes be confused with him directing things to happen. But those are two different events. We saw that in the creation. It was God's will that the world existed we see in revelation chapter 4 but then he actually did it he created it so he wished for it to happen or he willed for it to happen and then he did it god wills that a lot of things happen he wishes for example for the entire world to be saved second peter 3 9 he wants every person to be saved but not every person is going to believe in Christ. That's the only way you can be saved is by believing in him. But God knows this. He desires for all people to be saved. But he doesn't command all people that they will be saved. He knows who will believe. He knows who will not believe. 
uh, of course, because he's omniscient. He has always known these things, and this is a topic that we're going to get into uh, in greater detail in the weeks to come. The most important part of that whole discussion about the will of God is, though, that God's desire for us as people is that our will is conformed to his will. Jesus Christ, of course, being the the ultimate example of everything that is good. Well, that was him in the garden. Not my will, God the Father, but your will be done. Jesus Christ was perfectly always conformed to the will of God in his life. And that's, that should be our goal as well. So today, the title of our message is Faithful in Christ Jesus. We're going to look at this term saints that we find in Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. What does that actually mean? Well, we're going to find out that it's believers who have a mission. Believers in Jesus Christ who are given a mission. These Ephesians are faithful. Paul describes them as being faithful in Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, that's believers carrying out the mission that they were given. And they are in Christ Jesus. Probably the most important phrase really in talking about the church and, and what it is and who we are as believers, it's this phrase, in Christ or in Christ Jesus or in Him, in the Beloved. We see this same phrase over and over and over here in chapter 1. Very, very important uh, concept to understand. But we begin with the saints. Notice Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus. A lot of confusion about this term, saints, and, and actually what it means. It's based on, on the Hebrew term hagios, and it simply, it simply means to be holy. And there, there are a lot of misconceptions about this term saint. If you have... Uh, maybe an older uh, version of the Bible. I, a lot of King James versions have uh, the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Well, yeah, Paul is a saint, and so am I. So are you. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you're a saint as well. Uh, a lot of denominations uh, have the idea that only certain people are saints. They're like the super the super. Christians or the super believers, they're the ones who are gain this title of saint. And they had to do something special. Like they had to uh, perform miracles and these kinds of things. And a guy with a funny hat determines a uh, hundred years later after they die that, oh yeah, that guy did miracles and so they're now a saint. Well, that's completely unbiblical. There's nothing from the Bible that would that we could take and say, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. Saints have to perform miracles and that it has to be conferred upon them. That's totally foreign to the Bible as hopefully we'll see today. Saints, is, it's this term hagios is, is often translated as just simply holy. And it, that's for a very good reason because that's what the word means, holy separated or dedicated or consecrated to the service of God. That's what it means to be holy. And uh, people aren't the only items or entities that are designated as holy in the Bible. Uh, a lot of things are dedicated or given this title as holy. We see it in Matthew uh, chapter 4 and verse 5 speaks of uh, the holy city. Jeru that's Jerusalem, Zion, like we learned about in Sunday school this morning. That The city of Jerusalem is called holy in the Bible. Uh, Jesus refers to a specific place in Matthew 24, 15 as being the holy of holies. That's, that's a place in the temple where the Spirit of God dwelled when the temple was standing uh, that's where the Spirit of God was in that first 
temple anyway. He dwelled or dwelt in the Holy of Holies, this special place. It was so holy, it had that title twice, Holy of Holies. It was the holiest place because that's where God dwelled. It was the place that was completely consecrated to uh, service to the Lord, so much so that only the high priest, only one person on the earth was allowed to go into that place. And only on one day of the year, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, the high priest would go into that place and make sacrifices for the people of Israel. Any, uh, any other person who went in there would die. If the high priest did things incorrectly while he was in there, he would die. So they tied a rope to him and he had bells on his, on his uh, cloak. If the bells stopped ringing, uh, they'd probably give it a 10 Mississippi and uh-oh, he did something wrong. We have to pull him out because if we go in there to get him out, we're going to die. God means what he says. That's our our. Uh, lesson from the book of Amos. When God says things, he means it. Uh, and this holy of holies was one of those things that God meant when he said it. Second Peter 1.18, Peter refers to the Mount of Transfiguration as being the holy mountain, a specific place on the earth where Jesus Christ's uh, divinity, his divine nature was shown for just a moment of time there with Peter, James, and John. Uh, that is called a holy mountain because it was specifically designated to be the place where Christ would reveal that divine nature where people would be allowed to see it for a brief uh, period of time. So things can be holy in the Bible. And people, of course, can be holy as well. There are holy prophets, there's holy apostles, and like we have here, there are holy ones. Uh, that's a, an alternate translation there, and Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 could be to the holy ones, or to the holies. It, it would be a, a plural form of hagios, the holies, the holy ones who are at Ephesus. We see this term just applied to uh, believers. Ephesians 1, 4, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy, that we would be hagios, we would be separated, dedicated, consecrated to service uh, uh, for the Lord and blameless before him. 1 Peter uh, 1, 14 through 16, Peter has a, a discussion using the same term, hagios. Speaking to believers, he tells them, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy." God says. Uh, so believers in Christ are saints. If you are a person who is trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, trusted in what he did for you on the cross, then you are a saint. You are holy. You are dedicated or consecrated to the service of God. You may not have known that when you uh, signed up for this bargain of becoming a Christian, becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, but that is the fact of the matter, that as a believer, you are now holy. You are now dedicated to the service of God. And that's essentially the entire point of Ephesians. So we could probably just close our Bibles and move on to the next book if we wanted to, because that's what it's all about. That's why Paul is writing this letter. He is showing them that they are saints, that they are holy. And he begins, the first three chapters are showing them that they have this holy position. They have a righteous position with 
the God of the universe. He grants that to us because we have trusted in him. He gives us his righteousness, this holy position, this holy purpose. And now, and then, therefore, Ephesians 4 through 6, you should be living in this certain way, living up to the calling, living up to the position that has been given to you just because you trusted in Jesus Christ. We as believers have been set aside for the service of the Lord. That's simply what it means, this term hagios or saints, to be holy. Just like the, the implements in the temple were consecrated, sometimes the Old Testament says, or they, they were set aside for the service of the Lord. All of these bowls and utensils and all the things in the temple, they were made holy. That doesn't mean that they sprinkled holy water over them or they said a special prayer or anything like that. It was just the only reason that these things would be used or the only purpose that these utensils served was service for the Lord in the temple. That's what it means to be holy. That same title is given to us as Christians. We are holy. We are to be dedicated or consecrated to the service of the Lord. We as believers are all set apart. Notice that Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We love uh, this passage. We should anyway at Flushing Bible Church. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is, this salvation is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Simply by trusting in Christ, we have this forgiveness granted to us this uh, we have been saved through faith why because god graciously offers it to us it is a gift it is a gracious gift we can't possibly do anything to earn it if we're trying to earn the gift then it's no longer grace and it's no longer something from god we're doing it ourselves god makes it this way he makes salvation a gift so that we won't boast about having it uh, which is a good if th think about think about earning your salvation oh yeah that's right i've i've attained to a level that's so high spiritually that god the god of the universe almighty god confers his righteousness upon me because i've got it all figured out and i'm righteous myself well there you go you just boasted about your supposed righteousness so you've already violated your own or god's standard because you're thinking you're earning it yourself it can't possibly be earned it has to be gifted given to us and the only way it's received is by faith in jesus christ not our own works but notice verse 10 we always forget verse 10 we just skip over that we like the first part. I like the free gift. Who doesn't like to get free stuff? Everybody does. Verse 10, Ephesians 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That's what it means to be a saint. God grants us the opportunity to have salvation by his grace, through this gift of salvation, we receive it by faith, by trust, same way that I would trust that chair to hold me up. If I were to sit in it, I'm trusting that chair is going to hold me up. Well, that's the same thing I do with Jesus Christ. I trust that Jesus Christ will hold me up from going into the pit for eternity. I'm trusting him to do that. I believe that he will do that because that's what I deserve. I deserve to be in hell for eternity. That's what the Bible says. I'm not making that up. The Bible says that. 
All of us deserve that because we're all sinners. If you're a believer, you're trusting in Jesus Christ to keep you from that. And that's your only hope is him to keep you from doing that. Same way that I trust in that chair to just sit down in it, it's going to hold me up. Same kind of trust. Okay, now that you've done that, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand because he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's known all things from all times. So he's created these opportunities for you to do these things for him so that we would walk in them. That's what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, to be a saint. This isn't some thing that's just designated for super special people. It's designated for everyone who is trusted in Jesus Christ. And Paul wrote this letter to people who are at Ephesus. And we talked about that phrase, at Ephesus, whether or not that's actually in the text. Some of the early manuscripts don't have at Ephesus in the text. However, we saw that all of the manuscripts that exist, all the copies, the ancient copies of the Bible have Ephesians as the title of the book. Good indication that it was written to them. But this to the saints who are at Ephesus, that are is the is uh, a participle form of the verb to be. So it's those who are being at Ephesus, indicating those who are living at Ephesus. Sometimes that can be translated. Uh, It's written to the people who've trusted in Christ, who are living in Ephesus, who are part of the church at Ephesus. And then notice uh, what else Paul says about them. He doesn't just call them saints, but he says something else. He has another adjective to describe these people. He says that they are faithful. He's speaking to believers with a mission. And then he sees that, or he says that they have this mission because they're saints. And now he indicates that they're carrying out the message to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful. That who are is uh, in italics there in the, in the NASB anyway, indicating that it's not in the original text. It's understood because uh, the Greek people liked brevity in their writing. So they didn't always supply the verb every time like we do in English. It's understood. So it's to the saints who are living, who are being at Ephesus, and who are faithful. Now, what does this mean? This term faithful, it's based on the Greek term pistos. uh, And that is simply a, a term, means just exactly what it says there, faithful. Sometimes it's uh, the faith. It depends on how it's being used in the sentence. But uh, the verb form is very interesting for us. The, the verb form of faith or faithful, pistos, is pistuo. And that's often translated as believe or to have faith in. It is that term, Pistuo, the verb form there, is held up in the scripture as the single condition for the reception of salvation, of eternal life. And we get that from, uh, well, the whole Bible, but one book in particular. There's one book of the Bible in particular that is written to people so that they would know how to be saved. There's one book of the Bible that is written to people uh, essentially who aren't believers. It's kind of weird to think about, I guess. You think that, well, you just give the Bible to every, to any person. They can just read it and they'll get saved. And that's, that's wonderful. Well, there's only one book out of all 66 of them that is written so that people will know how to be saved. That's the gospel of John. 
He tells us that. John tells us that. That's the express reason why he wrote the book, so that people would know how to be saved. John 20 and verse 30 says, Therefore, Many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, the Gospel of John is uh, written around seven miracles that Jesus did, or signs. But these, these seven signs, have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. You won't find another book of the Bible that has that sort of a descriptor where the author says specifically why he wrote the book. And that book is written so that you can have eternal life. In other words, this is the book written to unbelievers. And John points out that unbelievers can have eternal life simply by believing in Jesus Christ, believing in what he has done for us. He doesn't say it once. He doesn't say it 10 times. He doesn't say it 50 times. He says it about a hundred times in the gospel of John. You have eternal life through one condition, believing in Christ and what he's done for you on the cross. And that is, that is simply the only condition. Oh, it did it anyway. There's only one thing that is sending people to an eternal destiny separated from God. It's not uh, name your pet sin, insert here. Oh, if you do this, there's no chance. That's not... That's not the way it works. There's only one thing that is separating us from eternity with God, and that's whether or not we have believed in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said that. You don't have to take my word for it. You can take Jesus' word for it. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he loved the world in this manner, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. There's one of those 100 times that it says that in the Gospel of John. Notice he goes on. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's God's wish or desire. His will is that the world would be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say he who believes in him and is obedient. He who believes in him and promises to never sin again. He who believes in him and counts the cost and picks up his cross and carries it daily and follows him and does all of these things is not judged. No. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. It doesn't say uh, because he has not believed and he's, uh, insert sexual sin here, uh, do the... He has not believed, plus robbed a bank. He has not believed, plus murdered people. None of that. People are condemned because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ of the Bible, the one who is the eternal Son of God, who stepped out of eternity into our world and lived a perfect, sinless life and gave that life on the cross for our sins. That's the Jesus of the Bible, the one who is coming again someday for us. He is the one who sacrificed himself for us. And we can have eternal life, God's righteousness given to us if we just simply believe in him. That's not the meaning that Paul is using here. <laughs> He's calling these saints faithful. Why? Because they are carrying out the mission that has been given to them. They are walking by faith. Here, 
pistos is being used as an adjective to describe them. They are faithful. They are walking by faith. Ephesians 5, 15 uh, through 21. We won't take the time to read all of that. That's getting into uh, this. We saw this in our scripture reading this morning, the beginning of this. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. They were walking by faith. They were trusting in the Lord moment by moment. He says in Colossians 2, 6, another one of these prison epistles written about the same time as Ephesians. That's why Ephesians and Colossians are kind of uh, sister letters or brother letters. They're very closely related because they have a lot of the same material. They're written at the same time. Colossians 2, 6, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, how did they receive Christ Jesus, the Lord? By faith, by believing in him. So walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed in overflowing with gratitude. Galatians 5.16, another way of describing how people can be faithful. Paul says to them, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That's how we can be, have this same description for ourselves as being faithful. If we walk by faith, trusting moment by moment in the Lord, walking the same way that we received him walking by the Spirit, by means of the Spirit. These people were, the Ephesians were demonstrating their faith to those around them. We see a very long discussion about that in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. A very uh, misunderstood portion of the Bible. Uh, James there saying exactly, precisely the same thing that Paul says about salvation and living the Christian life. James is a book written to believers, written to Jewish believers, people who have trusted in Jesus Christ. And so he is essentially giving them the same message as Ephesians. He wants them to then therefore live their lives in obedience to the Lord as saints, understanding you have been called to live in a certain way and you can be faithful if you demonstrate your faith to other people around you. That's what Ephesians, or James chapter 2 is all about. Paul describes this in Romans chapter 6, this same idea, same idea, presenting yourself as an instrument of righteousness. He uses that phraseology in uh, Romans chapter 6, instead of an instrument for unrighteousness, essentially. Be holy because I am holy. Be faithful because I am faithful, you could say. That's what God is calling us to do as believers. In Ephesians or James chapter 2, we see that Abraham was given righteousness not because he did things, but because he believed in God. Then he demonstrated his faithfulness to varying degrees uh, throughout his life. He took a wife that God didn't want him to do, that's not walking by faith. Believing that God would do what he said through Sarah is walking by faith. And lo and behold, God meant what he said. He wasn't fooling when he said, Sarah will have a baby. That baby will be the one through whom the promises are carried out. Abraham demonstrated his faith, and he became the head of the nation of Israel. Abraham was saved for a purpose. He carried out that purpose. 
Rahab, another example from James chapter 2. She is one who believed in the God of Israel. She trusted in the God of Israel that he was who he said he was. She believed that. She demonstrated that by saving the lives of the spies in the Old Testament. Faith separated from works is dead. Oh, it absolutely is. There is no doubt about that. If, you're, if you are not living your life in obedience to the Lord as a believer in Christ, then your faith is dead. It is not carrying out the purpose that God has for you. The purpose for you is found in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. If you are not carrying out your good works, then your faith is dead. It is separated from its purpose. That's what it means to be dead in the Bible. Death is simply another term for separation. <clears throat> separation. It doesn't mean that the faith ceases to exist. That's the way that we look at death sometimes. When a person dies, while well, they're not here anymore, they're, they cease to exist. But do they, according to the Bible? Do, do When people's physical bodies stop working here and we put them in the ground, do they cease to exist, according to the Scripture? No, they don't. No, they don't. We are eternal beings. And faith is is the same way. It doesn't cease to exist. It's just separated from its purpose. The purpose is that we would be holy because God is holy. That's the purpose of our faith in this life anyway. Uh, and when it's not, or when it is separated from its purpose, are those people still saved? Well, according to the Bible, they are. 1 Corinthians 3.15, If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. A picture of the judgment seat of Christ. That as believers, uh, we face a time of judgment as well. In the future, we're going to be judged based on how we have carried out in our lives, Ephesians 2.10. Uh, only believers will face that judgment. Uh, and we, we can separate the, these ideas in our minds, not separate them, but kind of actually bring them together, realizing that our salvation is one, one gift in three parts. The, the Ephesians are saints. They're called saints because they have done this. They heard the gospel, they considered it, and they believed it. So they are justified, we call that. Justification or the past tense of our sin. It's past tense because if you are a believer or you are a Christian, at some point in the past, you believed in Jesus Christ. You heard the gospel. You heard that you are a sinner separated from God, spiritually dead. That's where that term comes from. You're spiritually dead, not because your spirit doesn't exist. It's because your spirit is separated from holy, righteous God because of your sin. Well, there's an answer for that. Jesus Christ, he intervenes between God and man, pays the penalty for our sins. We can have righteousness. We can have life with God. If we trust in Christ, that's justification. The Ephesians here, Paul calls them saints because they're justified. They're faithful because they're doing this. The second tense or the present tense of our salvation, sometimes we call that sanctification. They are living the Christian life in obedience. They are carrying out Ephesians 2.10. They are created for these to do these good works, well, they're doing it. And we know from other places in the Bible that entails walking by faith. That's uh, praying to the Lord, uh, keeping up the lines of communication. We're, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we ha uh, foster that relationship the same way that we 
foster our relationship with our husband or our wife. We communicate with them. Uh, we keep short accounts. We should anyway. If I do something wrong against Suzanne, I confess that to her. We clear the air. We get that out of the way. Well, it's the same way with God. Keep a very short account with the Lord. Confess your sins to him. He's faithful and just. He will forgive you of your sins. 1 John 1, nine. Uh, we study about him. We get to know our spouse so we know them better. We can have a better relationship with them. Well, it's the same way with the Lord. The only way we're going to know more about Christ, about the Lord, is through studying his word. And then we live out the good works that he has prepared for us. That entails witnessing, telling other people about this salvation that they can have through faith in Jesus Christ and holy living. The Ephesians are faithful because they're doing these things. They're saints because of this, because they've trusted in Christ. They're called faithful because they're living it out in their daily lives. This third tense, future tense of our salvation, we sometimes call that glorification because one day, Jesus Christ is coming again in the air for believers to catch us up, to be with him, and take us back to the Father's house. John 14, Jesus talked about that first. Paul talks about it, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we, 1 Corinthians 15 as well. We will receive in a twinkling of an eye a glorified body and taken back to be with the Lord for eternity. We will always be in his presence. Uh, one of the songs we sang this morning kind of mentioned that this, uh, that we're going back to our eternal home with the Lord. Oh, not quite technically correct. We're going to be with the Lord forever where he is, where he, we will be also. When he comes again to the earth to rule and reign over his kingdom, we're not going to be in a, an eternal home. We're going to be riding right behind him, with him, when he comes again. Revelation uh, 19. Uh, that, you can even see a hint of that in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 14. You can, I think it's 14. You can uh, see that hinted at. The fact that believers are going to be coming with Christ again when he comes to rule and reign upon the earth. That's our glorification. That's our future. These are things that uh, should motivate us to serve the Lord with our lives. That judgment seat of Christ will happen, I believe, in heaven after the rapture. That's when all of the church is going to be in one place at one time. The people from the last 2,000 years who've heard this message I'm telling you right now and have believed it, trusted in it. They're all Christians. Think of the millions and probably billions of people who've done that over time. We're all going to be in heaven at the same time after the rapture of the church. And Christ is going to judge us for the way that we've lived our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Will some of us be kicked out of heaven? Oh, your life didn't quite measure up. You're out of here. That's not the way it works. If you've trusted in Christ, your sin is taken care of. Sin is no longer the issue. It has been dealt with. Uh, not because you're so great, because Jesus Christ is so great. He's eternal God, paid the eternal penalty for our sins. That's why we can have all of these blessings. Because God in his mercy, grants us a position in Christ Jesus. This is, this is really the source of our salvation, that God views us the same way, God the Father views us the same way that he views Jesus Christ, if you've believed in him. That's what it means to believe in him. That he, and the result of believing in him. He's giving us Jesus Christ's righteousness. I mean, that's hard to, that's hard to, to wrap our, our minds around. But we, the way Paul kind of uh, describes that as being in 
Christ. In Christ Jesus, we are given His position. These Ephesians are saints who are faithful, who are in Christ Jesus. One of the most important phrases in all of Christianity. Certainly one of the most important uh, things that we can understand that should be motivation for our Christian life. To, I, I know for me personally, I can remember uh, studying this in depth uh, oh, probably 20 years ago now, 15 to 20 years ago, and realizing that, oh, this is the motivation for the Christian life. It's not that God is standing over me with a hammer or that the axe is ready to come down and if I disobey, you know, that'll get you so far. But it's not gonna it's not gonna last that long. It's not that powerful of a motivator. However, when we consider the position, what Christ has done for us, that is a true motivator to holy living when we realize what he has actually done for us, his generosity in granting us every spiritual blessing, verse 3 says, that he just gives that to us. That should be motivating to us. And if you are a believer, this is, this is you. You are in Christ Jesus. Matter of fact, uh, your hope is is in him. You're looking forward to the day when he comes again for you. Your eternal destiny is one with him for eternity in Christ. If you're not a believer, you are outside of Christ. You are not in Christ. Your eternal destiny is very different. You are without hope. The Bible says your eternal destiny is the lake of fire. I mean, that's not me. That's not the uh, Bible thumping fire and brimstone guy, pastor. He didn't make that up. But that's what the Bible says. That's what the Lord himself says. That's your destiny if you're outside of Christ because of sin. In Being in Christ is very different. This is the, the very, being in Christ, in him, is the very foundation for all of the Christian life, for everything that we have as believers in Christ. That's verses 3 through 14. One very long, complex sentence in the Greek. It's not that way in our English Bibles, but that's the way it is in Greek. One long sentence from verses 3 through 14. And we have these blessings in Christ. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us. Over and over we see this uh, phrase, in him or in Christ, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. Uh, about 12 to 13 times in, the, in, these short, in these verses, this short passage, one long sentence, Paul talks about the blessings that we have in Christ. That's chapters 1 through 3. It's a recurring theme in, in chapters 1 through 3. All that we have in Christ or in Him. And you notice early on here in Ephesians, there's no discussion about how you get to be in Him. It's just stated as a fact. In Him, we have these many blessings. Well, how do we get to be in Him? Notice Romans 3 and verse 21. It says, But now apart from the law of the righteousness of God has been man but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. There's that phrase, we are in Him by faith, simply by trusting in Christ and what He has done for us. Then, when we do that, we are placed in Him, in Christ. We have all of these spiritual blessings given to us that it's part of the grace package if you will all of this comes in the gift of salvation these many spiritual blessings that we'll get into in verses 3 through 14 all of this comes by grace through faith god graciously offers the gift of salvation to the world. He can offer it to the world because eternal deity paid the penalty. Jesus Christ paid the penalty. It's not just a, a bull or a sheep or something like this. This is eternal God, creator of the universe, all powerful, offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus Christ's blood can pay the penalty for the sins of the entire world. The Bible uh, specifically says that that's the case. So therefore, salvation can be offered to all people because it has been paid for by the eternal one, Jesus Christ. And God grants us his righteousness, puts us in him, sees us the same way that he sees Jesus Christ when we put our faith in him. And that is the motivation for the Christian life, that we are in Christ. And that's who these Ephesians were. They are saints, not because they're super spiritual and have been uh, consecrated by the Apostle Paul, picked certain ones to be saints. They're saints simply because they have believed in Christ. They are holy they are dedicated, consecrated to his service simply because they trusted in him. That's Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 in a, in a passage, if you will. Saints because they've believed. Dedicated to service to the Lord because they've believed. The Ephesians were faithful because they were carrying out the mission that God gave them. He dedicated them to service to him, and they were faithful in carrying that out, walking by faith. And they are in Christ Jesus because they have believed. They are in Christ. They have all of these spiritual blessings because every person who is in Christ has these spiritual blessings offered to them. Every person has a spiritual bank account that is completely overflowing, eternally full, not because they're earning it, not because they in, uh, you know, made the right call on the stock market, simply because they've trusted in Christ. Jesus Christ has an infinite amount of spiritual blessing to offer to all of us in all of our accounts. Every person who's trusted in Christ's account is completely full because it's coming from the omniscient, omnipotent God, Jesus Christ. Let's go to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this portion of your word that we were able to look into this morning. I thank you that you have saved us for a purpose, that we we aren't uh, saved so that we can just flounder around in this world and try to figure out uh, our place in this world, you've, you've done that hard work for us. We are, as believers, uh, dedicated to service for you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us in our 
endeavor to be faithful. Remind us to walk by faith. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us in our lives where we need to be convicted, where our lives aren't measuring up to the standard that you have for us. I, I pray that you just wouldn't leave us alone in that regard, as painful as that can be. I pray that your that, that convicting work would continue uh, in our lives and that we would be 